Good afternoon, Facebook Live. This is Robin Kirby Gatto. Welcome to session three of Destiny. Oh my goodness. I am super excited about this series. We are continuing the new anointing, the fresh anointing that we started in the last broadcast. So as you join on, be super hopeful and expectant. Amen. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and get an icebreaker. Let me go ahead and get that. And I pray that you are blessed this day. I see Katie Higgum. God bless you. Thank you for joining in. And oh my goodness, I had to open the door because it is warm today and I need some air circulating <laughs> throughout the apartment. So as you join on today, be super hopeful and expectant. I'm going to scroll off the comments and I'll come back later on that. And we are going to get started in prayer. Amen. God, we just rejoice at the strength of your name, which is powerful and mighty to save. As you bring us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding through your word of truth to have the knowledge of Christ so that we can behold your glory in Jesus name amen and so we're picking back up with Jeremiah 29 11 through 13 and we're gonna look at different scriptures in the New Testament and the Old Testament to perceive this new anointing this fresh anointing I talk about this in Rev 22 2, the wild ox anointing and we're gonna get to that today and we're going to look at some perspectives of this new anointing, this fresh anointing. Let's begin in Jeremiah 29, and let's do 11 through 13 again. Amen. For I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord, thoughts and plans for welfare and peace, and not for evil, to give you hope in your final outcome. Then you will call upon me, and you'll come and pray to me. And I will hear and I will heed you. And then you will seek me, inquire for and require me as vital necessity. And find me when you search for me with all of your heart. So again, we are looking at part two of Jeremiah 29. We've already looked at the first part as it relates to God's thoughts. And then in the last broadcast, we looked at in the beginning of that broadcast the new anointing the fresh anointing which is revealed in part 2 of Jeremiah 29 11 and it is I know my thoughts and plans of welfare and peace Shalom that God has for you amen and so that's gonna be our focus today and oh my all I can say is get ready when you go through the trying and the testing of your faith, which is more precious than gold, you are going to be stretched more than ever. And it's going to seem as though you are pressed in on every side, but know that greater is Christ Jesus in you than he that is in this world. And those that are joining in, God is just telling me that someone is being attacked and he wants me to pray for you. And he says it's the spirit of divination and the spirit of Leviathan. So in the name of Jesus, I take authority over the assignment of divination. Python that has been trying to bring division and be divisive against your person. And I take the sword of God's word and cut those cords and command them to be uprooted out of your belly and go into the wilderness in the name of Jesus, that unclean spirit of Python. I take authority over Leviathan and the messages of the enemy that have been twisting the word of truth in your members. And I take the sword of the spirit and cut those cords and command that assignment of Leviathan to loose you and to go into the wilderness in jesus name amen oh my goodness i could just feel it coming against my person and god was telling me 
that that attack was coming against those watching this broadcast. And it's really interesting that it comes particularly to this broadcast because we are looking at the new anointing, the fresh anointing. One of the things that you're going to be able to discern in the wilderness is which voice is speaking to you. And the voice of Satan will always wear you out, whereas the voice of God will compel you. It will thrust you forward. And we're going to look at that word thrust as the truth in him resurrecting us today. That thrust, T-H-R-U-S-T, that truth in him resurrecting us today. That is what the new anointing does, the fresh anointing. It propels you into your destiny and you're compelled to run with love. You're compelled to continue the race and to not give up. And so one of the tests that you'll endure in the wilderness which is navigating into your destiny. And let me get back to explaining this because some of those joining in might not understand this. But when you go into your destiny, you're going to be attacked on every end. The enemy's not going to be happy. He's not going to be throwing you a party and say, woo, so-and-so's going into their destiny. Let's get excited. No, he is going to send more assignments against you. And I want to say two things here to just lay out the course that we'll be taking and to glorify the Father. One of the things that God really put on my heart and just brought such a revelation about is how so many Christians glorify the enemy. So many Christians glorify the enemy. And they're always talking about spiritual warfare. They're always talking about warfare. They're always talking about this. And it is just wearing out the saints. Let me tell you, there is warfare. But the more that you draw near to God, people will not even perceive your warfare because of the glory of Christ revealed in you. Now listen to that one more time and I'm going to bring in some of my own testimony as I've been raised by the Lord in ministry. Again, a test that you'll go through is if you're going to be like hee-haw, oh woe is me, or if you're going to be like the victory of Christ inside of you and you're going to be praising God in your circumstances, in your trial, knowing greater is Christ in you. One of the things that God has me reprove those that are on my wall and different instances privately as well as publicly when needed is to not glorify Satan. There is nothing that bothers the Father that agitates him, that grieves him more than people in the church glorifying Satan and us talking more about Satan than we're talking about God. Understand, when you have the new anointing, you are not going to be glorifying your warfare. You're going to be glorifying God and who he is. And the spirit of divination, Python, will come against your person and bring divisiveness. And it will make you divisive against God. Oh yeah, you'll be kicking against the goads. And God will have you at a road to Damascus moment, so to speak, as an analogy, in order to deal with your heart so that you can see how you are kicking against the goads, against what God wants to do. So many people cannot navigate the wilderness in their destiny, and that is the place of trying and testing of their soul, of their self-image, of their heart, to bring up the impurities, to make Isaiah 40, the crooked places straight, 
to bring down the mountains, to lift up the valleys in order that the glorification of God would be made known in our members, the fullness of salvation. And so in 2004, God began to have me pray something specifically. He said, Robin, I want you to ask for me to bring down all your idols. And I said, glory to God, bring down all my idols. And he said, I want you to ask for prudence. And I'm like, glory to God, 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 give me prudence. Hallelujah. And he said, I want you to ask for humility. And so I said, God, just bring down all my idols. Give me prudence and give me humility. And within a moment's time, it almost felt like suddenly, like the snap of a finger. Oh my goodness, everything in my life seemed to crumble. We lost our house. I lost my vehicle. And we were stripped, totally, Rich and I, and we had nowhere in which to move at the time. And so God said, Robin, I want to teach you something. Wait on me. And this is what we're looking at with a new anointing, the fresh anointing. And this is Isaiah 40, 31. And this is Psalm 46, 10. Wait on God. And let me tell you, your heart will be tested. And Python will be exposed, and Leviathan, which is the voice speaking to you. You're going to know the voice speaking to you. If your flesh has not yielded to the Father, then there is opportunity for Leviathan, which is pride. And the way Leviathan operates is in a spider's web, as in Isaiah 59, and I'm not going to get into all of that right now. I'm going to get into one component largely with Leviathan, the counterfeit of Holy Spirit in which Leviathan is, is it's about the message. It's about the message, and it counterfeits the Spirit of the Lord. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, where the Lord of hosts is, in scripture it is about the power of the message and so leviathan will come and leviathan will speak to people's minds in the areas of their soul where it's lifted up in pride and that they think they know what to do they know how to be god they know how to act they know how to react they know what to say they know what to message. All of that. I'm telling you, I know what I'm talking about. And you will go through the sifting of your soul. And whether or not you're going to wait on the Lord. And it will be like that of King Saul. It's the test that King Saul failed. And that was when God told him to wait. And to not present the sacrifice until Samuel arrived. Not, not, not go to battle till Samuel arrived. He would not wait. Pressure came against Saul. Pressure started speaking to him as pride within his ego lifted up. And exalted itself against God and thought he could do what he wanted to do. We see this with Uzziah when he goes into the sanctuary to offer that which only the priest was allowed. But his heart was lifted up and he thought he could do it and he failed the test. I'm telling you time and time again, it is about, will you wait on God? Will you do what God tells you to do? And so many people cannot go into the call. They are not chosen and they cannot navigate through the wilderness because the voice of the enemy is speaking to them and it is stirring them up with lies within their self-image that would exalt itself against the knowledge of Christ. I'm telling you, saints, there's going to be people watching this. You're in this trial right now. And I know this. 
And let me tell you, there are times that you will not pass. And God knows that. He knows your heart. He knows your weaknesses. And He knows that you are imperfect. And He knows that He can show you what your heart is so you can repent. So you can repent. I just get so stretched seeing Christians that glorify Satan so much on social media and especially the false prophets and false teachers and people flock to them. They're drawn to them and they receive from them the knowledge of good and evil and they wonder why they never go into the call. Understand this, saints. Many are called, but few are chosen. And this is probably a more sobering message today where God is dealing with our hearts. And I feel this just holy anger. Oh my goodness. I just feel this holy anger. And I just feel fire all through my arms and in my hands. Oh my goodness. I just feel the fire of God. And there is a holy anger that is in the Father where we are profaning His house, where we are not going into that place of promise because we have stretched out our own arm to play God and we license it by saying God said. Saints, there's so much that God wants me to share. I don't think we're going to be able to finish this broadcast on the new anointing today. God is just heavy on my heart. and He wants me to start sharing some testimonies. And so when he brought me and stripped Rich and I of everything we owned, our house in 2005 was about to be auctioned. And it was going to foreclose. That's where we were. I don't mind being transparent. Everything was stripped. Rich couldn't find a job. I was doing some home health. It was, it was a tough season. And we were stripped of everything. And then God downsized us. And I knew that we were supposed to move. And we had two weeks before we were to be out on the streets. And then God began to speak to me. And he said, Robin... I want you to wait. I want you to wait. And you will not move until I tell you to move. Well, two weeks. We're not going to have anywhere to live. God, what do we do? So I can tell you, I had shalom. And I was in a massive anointing of the fear of the Lord then. And remember, the purpose of the fear of the Lord is to keep you from sin. And so, Rich was stressed he was stressed because this was Robin's test for this avenue of preparing me for the new anointing, the fresh anointing for the call. Again, I had my master's and bachelor's in social work and I had gone back to law school and so I did not know that God was bringing me into ministry, but he was preparing me in that hour and so God told me to wait. And we had driven throughout the Alabaster area in Alabama. And there were houses for sale. And one house just stayed in my forefront of my mind. And God just spotlighted it. And then a gentleman knocked on our door where we were living before we moved. And he said, won't you do a quick sell, a quick claim sell deed. Will you do a quick claim deed? And I, and Holy Spirit said no. And Rich was nervous. And I said, Rich, I have heard from God. We are not to move. I don't care what pressure we feel. Satan brings pressure. God brings peace. Understand, Saul acted out of pressure. And remember, the name Saul in Hebrew means to ask. So Saul was asking to do something, not out of peace. Remember, God has welfare and peace for us, it says in Jeremiah 29, 11. 
And that's what the new anointing is based on. And when we act out of pressure, we are not in the new anointing, the fresh anointing. And the test is going to come to us if we're going to act out of pressure or if we're going to go forth in peace, shalom. And when we do, it will glorify the Father. If we're acting out of pressure, this is how awesome God is. Oh my goodness, this is such a brilliant teaching. He just keeps giving me stuff. I'm like, God, please wait a minute. I can't get it out fast enough. And so God is telling me that if we're acting out of pressure, we're going to glorify Satan. And so the way that you can tell that you're not in the new anointing, the fresh anointing yet, is if you're glorifying the enemy and what's going on. If you're glorifying God. And I can tell you that most of the spiritual warfare I go through, which is a lot, okay? And it's so funny because I've had people invite me to speak and do meetings and conferences and preach. And they always tell me, Robin, we've never experienced this much warfare. And I'm like, woohoo, glory to God, hallelujah. And you're going to find out in a minute. Glory to God, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, that there's warfare. Then the anointing is going to be strong and Satan's mad. And that's how I like Satan. I like him mad. And so when you're pressing into the place of the promise, pressure's going to come. But are you going to respond to the pressure or are you going to wait on peace? Because so many respond to pressure just like King Saul. Just like King Saul. And they don't respond to peace. Do you hear this? Do you hear this? Hold on one second. I'm just pulling up scripture. The flesh wants to fill in silence. The flesh doesn't like silence. 1 Samuel 12 through 15. We'll see how far we get. 1 Samuel 13. The flesh doesn't like silence. It wants to fill in the space. And so Leviathan, pride, will come in and put pressure for us to not wait and to fill the space up, to do something, to speak something. When you go through years of God zipping your lip where you cannot speak, hallelujah, I've got the t-shirt, been there, done that. You learn not to respond to pressure. And that was going on at the same time of this transition where we were about to be homeless. And so all of a sudden, there was a new sign at this house that had been spotlighted to me. And the house said, no longer was it for sale, but it was for rent. It was for rent. And somebody's watching that needs this testimony. And our credit wasn't good at the time. It wasn't looking good for us. And I said, that's our house. That's what we're going to, that's where God wants us. And I called the landlord and lo and behold, he didn't do a credit check on us, did nothing. And he said, just come at this house, meet me at the house, sign the contract and I'll give you the keys. Just like that. And it was about less than two weeks that we were about to be on the streets. In less than two weeks, and this was in 2005, October, I believe, 2005. And at that moment, it blessed my soul. And we moved into a house that was about half, half the size of what we had been. And it felt like a mansion. And it was on, are you ready, drum roll, Warrior Drive. And that is when I started Princess Warriors. And that is when I started the book, Glory to Glory Sisterhood Series, where Princess Warriors was birthed from. And God taught my hands to war. He taught my hands to war in the means of praise, in the means of prayer. God taught me to war not glorifying, glorifying the enemy. That was Matthew calling in. But only glorifying God. 
Hold on one second. Glory to God. Only glorifying God. And so that address prophesied that test. And we were there for a couple of years. And I learned spiritual warfare from God by the word of truth. And that warfare was not to glorify Satan, but it was to glorify God. Now let's look at 1 Kings, 1 Samuel 13. Let's look at 1 Samuel 13 and pull it up as we look at King Saul. King Saul. And we're going to look at him offering the sacrifice. Offering the sacrifice. Let's look at verse... Eight. Verse 8, 1 Samuel 13, Saul waited seven days according to the set time Samuel had appointed, but Samuel had not come to Gilgal. Now Gilgal is the place to remove the reproach. It means they're rolling away of the stone to remove the reproach. Gilgal represents Galilee, and it is actually where we get Galilee from. And Galilee represents for what Jesus did at Calvary for us, which means to remove the reproach. And so the crooked places in your heart of pride will exalt themselves against Christ and it will amplify the warfare and it won't amplify God's glory. And you will respond out of the pressure of warfare. And you won't wait on God and the power of His glory. This is what we're going to see in 1 Kings 13. I mean, 1 Samuel 13. Hold on one second. Matthew keeps messaging me. Verse 8 again. Saul waited seven days according to the set time Samuel had appointed, but Samuel had not come yet to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from Saul. The people were scattering from Saul. So Saul said, Bring to me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering, which he was forbidden to do. What? Isn't it interesting that Uzziah... And King Saul got out of their lane because of pressure. And it was because of pride. King Saul's pride rose up when he felt pressure as the people were scattering. Oh my goodness. Can you preach? Can you stay when it's just you preaching to the sand and the cactuses in the wilderness, or will you perform to get a few to come to your meeting or to entertain them? Now let's shift this in business. Will you stay faithful to your business? Will you plow? Will you stay when you don't see prosperity? When it looks like nothing is growing or going, will you stay put because you heard from God and you wait for his glory or will you respond out of the pressure of the warfare and just not stick with it and end up glorifying Satan and get knocked out of your destiny because you can't keep quiet you can't shut up be quiet tell the flesh to sit down and bow down to the name of Jesus and be quiet and wait own God. This is your test because you're not getting the new anointing, the fresh anointing until you wait on him, until you pass this test. And God is giving you the blueprint of what is going on. That's why I see so many people not go in their destiny and they hang out with groups of others who don't go through their destiny and they're sitting out at a camp in the wilderness of no past the pressure test 
and have a big campground and a campfire and a conference and a meeting and give each other false prophecies and false teachings that make them feel comfortable in their own skin when they're going to stand before God someday and answer for why they could not get through the pressure. And why their pride rose up. Why Leviathan was allowed to speak into their members through their mouth to other people and get them bound in pride and speak to their pride and have a retreat of pride. Woo! Come to this meeting. It's a bless me meeting, a bless you meeting. No, it's a retreat of pride. Run! In the name of Jesus, wake up, saints. Few pass this test. They fall. They don't get chosen. Oh my goodness, I feel the fire of God all up in my members. Saints, I am telling you, there are so many people bragging about their warfare and bragging about pride. Can you shut up about your warfare? Can you zip the lip and just be quiet and wait on God and look up to where your help comes from and not try to give a sacrifice of, oh, woe is me. Oh, look how awesome I am. I've got so much warfare. i got this going on. Let me tell you what. I don't talk about all the warfare I go through. And it is a hell coming against me. But the church of Christ in me, hallelujah, prevails against that hell. Do you hear this, saints of God? Oh, I got to get to the testimony in a minute. Do you understand that on that house, which was my house before I married Rich, my ex, let me just give you some more. Oh my goodness, y'all don't know the testimony. You don't know the testimony. Woo! Hallelujah, my God is good. Hallelujah. He is awesome. He is amazing. Let me give you the pre-testimony, pre-Rich testimony. Because I was in that house before I married Rich. You know how I got to that house? My ex-husband, who was in medical school and finished, we had left Mississippi, had Christopher, our first child, and moved to Alabama, to Birmingham. And God blessed us with that house. And three years after that, he had finished his residency. And in that chief resident year, He found a new woman. And let me just testify, he is a changed man. He is awesome. He's repented. He has an awesome wife that we love now. And they've been married going on 11 years. And we absolutely love them. But I have to give you this pre-testimony. I did not know that he was going to leave me. That I was going to be a single mom. I was in my first semester of graduate school for Masters of Social Work. And one week... Before my midterm exams, he leaves me. But let me tell you what was happening prior to that. Prior to that, we had put a contract on a house in Gunnersville, Alabama, that was my dream home. <laughs> Woo! It was everything I wanted on a mountain by the water, overlooking the lake. And it was my dream home, and it had a French influence like Louisiana, like New Orleans. And it was my dream house. And he and I were walking with my in-laws one weekend to look at that house right before he left me in 97. And as we walked around this house, my step and uh, my ex step in law, my ex in law stepmother, mother in law, my ex step mother in law, it was his stepmother. She and I were in the backyard, and she said, Robin, aren't you excited about moving here? And see, they knew. He had already let them know what was about to happen. Guess who didn't know? Robin. And she said to me, she said, Robin, aren't you glad about this house? And I looked at her, and I'll never forget this, okay? I looked at her, and I said, Brenda, this is the weird thing, is I cannot see myself in this house I cannot see myself in this house and we were going through this rough patch but I didn't know he was about to leave me then shortly after like I said a week before my first semester midterms of master's degree of social work he left me 
And what I found out is that he was trying to sell the house so that me and the boys would have no place to go when he could get rid of that house. And we would have to find a new place to go. But guess who didn't let him sell the house? God! And so he and I were the ones that had that house built. And so I was a single mother four and a half years. Rich comes into my life. He and I buy the house. We refinance it, get a mortgage with both he and I on it. And so now it's 2005. Two weeks to go. But let me tell you about that house. Because that house was driven. And four years prior to us getting out of that house in 2005, four years before in 2001, I was approached by a law firm for a case. A case against Drivet. A class action lawsuit. And that was four years before we're about to move out. So now it's 2005, October. We're moving out. It's the day of our move. We're moving out into this smaller place. And I get a call from that law firm, and it could only be for first-time home buyers. And that law firm says, Robin, you've got a settlement on your house for that drivet that you've had to endure with mold and all that that has gone on while you've lived there. And I said, well, you better accept it today because that house tomorrow morning will no longer be our house. And had I not waited, had I allowed the pressure of the enemy to move me, we would not have received the lawsuit. Action settlement. Do you hear this? Our God has a plan, and you can't see it, and you won't know it in the waiting. You just have to wait. Now, let's read this further. Glory to God. This is such a powerful teaching. Verse 9 says, Saul said, Bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. Isn't it funny? He's saying peace offerings. It's a peace offering because God has peace. But if pressure comes on you, there will be a false peace. And Leviathan will tell you to do something contrary to the will of the Father. And you will be kicked out of that test and take it again. So let's look at verse 10. And just as he finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Isn't it interesting? Samuel means God is heard. Saul asked, God heard. <laughs> okay. Samuel said, what have you done? Saul said, because I saw the people were scattering from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines were assembled at Michmash, I thought the Philistines will come down upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. So I forced myself, oh, I had to force myself to offer the burnt offering. I forced myself. Woo! That will preach. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolish. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For the Lord, which he, has, he would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. Woo! And the Lord has commanded him to be prince and ruler over his people because you have not kept what the Lord God had commanded you. Do you hear this, saints of God? Do you hear this? He act foolishly. So let's look at one Hebrew word out of this teaching, out of this particular chapter, and let's get into a revealing at a deeper level of what is going on. Amen. And so, as we look at the war of the Philistines against his person, it's at the place of Michmash. And that word means hidden, 
in Hebrew, and it comes from a primary verb, which means to store away or in the memory. What? Mikmash means to store away or in the memory. Why is this so important? Because, hello, mindfulness, the mind of Christ, I talk about how memories are stored up in, in at the G-protein coupled receptor in your body, which keeps you from being consecrated, and that the information signaling of those memories in your body affect and influence all of your behavior. All of your behavior. All of it. That you're running on misinformation from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Where good is perverted. Oh, I'm so good. I am King Saul. God's anointed me. I'm the anointed. I am the first king. Oh, I am so good. I can offer the sacrifice. Do you hear this? Misinformation. And sin actually means to miss the mark. Sin. Information. You think you're so good that pride steps up and you get out of your lane instead of waiting on God. Do you know how many openings have come open for me to preach and teach and how I was had opportunity to go on a circuit? Was asked early on as the false prophets and false teachers that were big, national, internationally known, saw the gift of God in me operating as I ministered at meetings, as I ministered on social media. And God said, Robin, no, there is pressure on you to perform and you will not go through that door. It's not a me. And God said, I want to pull you away into the hidden place. Micmash, I want to pull you away to the hidden place and deal with your body. Romans 12, 1, consecrate the body. Will you perform out of pressure or will you wait on God? This is the test that you go through. And saints, there is no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. God can bring you through to another test and he can cause you to triumph. But will you humble yourselves? Will you zip your lip? Will you tell the flesh to shut up? Will you tell other people to be quiet? When they're wanting to glorify the gift instead of God, will you allow a humbling of your soul to know that the only good thing in you is Christ alone. Woo! So very few can enter that. So saints, we're going to end today's broadcast because the next broadcast, glory to God, is going to show you what happens when you wait. When you wait on the Lord, woo! He shall renew your youth. He shall renew your strength. And you will mount up like eagles. God bless you. I love you.